Today, I'm interviewing Jonathan Becker, Chief Marketing Officer for SAP, where he defines social business. Please join us on this episode of Substance. Jonathan, it is awesome to have you here. Thank you so much for joining me here today on Substance. I've been looking forward to just talking to you. You know, I've followed you on Twitter. We've tweeted back and forth. It's kind of funny how this came together over Twitter. Well, you know, social wins over real life, right? Right. Thanks for having me here. I'm really excited to do this as well. You bet. You bet. Well, let's just jump right into it. Okay. I want to talk to you a little bit about, well, a lot about being a CMO at a $20 billion corporation. I'm sure everybody asks you that question, but before we get to that, I'm really excited to talk to you about you and what you're all about. What is it that drives you? What gave you the passion to be to where you're at now? It's funny because I'm both a private person and a public person. I mean, I'm pretty social. Some people like to call me the social CMO. I'm not sure I really like that designation Mm. that much because I talk a lot in public forums. And so a lot of people sort of know me, but they don't know me because there's this fine line between the public persona that you have and the not so public persona as well. One of the things I've talked a fair about is I love being outdoors. Um, One of the things I love to do as many Sundays as I can, but I travel maybe a bit too much, is go on a big hike or a long walk try to get away from technology, get away from people. That's a tough thing to say, but mm-hmm. you know, I'm allowed, allowed a lot of crowds and people and just let my mind kind of wander. Right. And you know, it sort of rehabilitates me. It reinvigorates me. It makes yeah. me feel refreshed. And unfortunately, you know, it also gets me thinking really good thoughts. And one of the things I love to do that I don't get to do nearly as much as I want is write. Mm-hmm. I sometimes think that when I was a little kid, Some kids dream of being a firefighter or a policeman or something. I wanted to be a writer. I know that's a crazy thing to say, but I love to read. And I always wanted to, and I kind of got lost in books in the same way that some people get lost in movies. And I always thought, wouldn't it be great if I could write that way so that when people read the stuff, they got lost in the story as well. Mm -hmm. And it turns out you can't really write for anyone else. You have to end up writing for yourself. Mm. And so when I'm going on these long walks, when I'm going on a hike, I'm dreaming up stories. And often that's where my blogs come, because I write a lot of blogs, is ideas or notions or things that make me go, I wonder why it works this way. And then I go back and do some research, ask people, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So if I can get outdoors, if I can go for long walks, and frankly, sometimes even in the office, just leaving the office and going for a walk, it's kind of cool to have a business meeting where you ask your business colleague, eh, let's not sit in the chair. Let's actually go walk around campus and just talk about what's going on. Mm -hmm. Getting outside is a big part of the personality. So take me back a little bit, or even a lot, back to maybe a little bit more of your childhood and how, I mean, nobody really plans on being This is a kind of CMO. therapy session coming out, isn't it? It is, and hopefully we'll get you to cry. That's my, that's wow. my uh, okay. yeah, we're right. gonna get some tears going here. But no, um, in all seriousness, what kind of activities did you do that really helped you to kind of, you know, succeed in life? I, I'm not what people would call a classically trained CMO or a classically trained marketer. Um, I don't have a brand background, or at least not how brands were described 10, 15, 20 years ago. I actually didn't even go to business school, so I don't have an official business degree. Um, we'll get to that in a moment, but I'm a technologist by background, and my technology focus has always been analytics. It's numbers, trying to figure out the science of stuff that's going on, not just the art of stuff. And I've always mm. had appreciation of the art side, thus the wanting to write and getting involved in storytelling as well. But I think maybe the thing that shaped me the most is this weird dichotomy. I grew up in a really small town. Uh, For the sake of anonymity, I won't actually name the town, but just to give you a sense of how small it was, there were 13 people in my high school graduating Mm. class. And one of them was an exchange student from New Zealand. So uh, if you think about that, that's a very small pool. Now, I know my class was abnormally small. The class before me was like 20 and the class after me was 20, but it's still small town. And when you're in a small town, the way you interact and the way you learn is very Mm one-to-one, right? You can interrupt the teacher, because I had classes with only two people in them sometimes, Mm -hmm. and say, wait, I don't understand that. So you're used to this. Uh, This is what I grew up in, right? And just to make it even more complicated, my parents are both Eastern European, right? They met in New York City. They moved us down to Southern Virginia and North Carolina. So... I'm I'm the first person in my family born in the U.S., so I I looked different. Where's the accent? Uh, I think I learned to get rid of it. (laughs) After I graduated high school, I left town. I come back to still visit my parents from time to time and some of my friends, but I always felt like I was a citizen of the world more than a citizen of that particular town or just the U.S., because obviously I'm born here because I'm a U.S. citizen by passport, but I have family in, I don't know, seven, eight, nine different countries. My My direct family lives all over the U.S., indirect family is all over the world. I think because of that, when I went away to university, my first class, and I remember this, was Chemistry 101, 
And we were in one of those really big lecture halls with 500 people. Wow. And you get the grad student at the bottom of the lecture hall, you know, starting to write on the whiteboard. Mm, it's probably a chalkboard back then. I don't really think <laughs> we had whiteboards yet. Right. And I realized that this social thing that we all do wasn't going to work for me anymore. That the inter being able to interrupt the teacher, being able to ask individualized questions isn't that anymore, that we're a mass world. Mm -hmm. And I think from that day, I don't know that I really understood it then, because you're 17, 18 years old, I was trying to figure out how do you have personal interactions in a world of mass interaction? How do you solve the scale problem? Right. And that's what I've been trying to do basically my whole life, which is how do you have individual inter interactions mm -hmm. in a world where you can't sit down and talk to people anymore? And that's, if you look at all the technology, if you look at all the jobs, if you think about what drives me a marketer, yeah. that's always the same fundamental problem. That is an excellent lead into how do you scale relationships? Now you're talking global, and I love hearing this worldly approach that you've grown up in in your own family. Now you're talking about that as a business too. How do you scale relationships? So I think one of the problems with the question is when people think scale relationships, they usually think what I would call ego metrics. Mm -hmm. Now you may have heard me use this phrase before. And so people will say, I have 61 million people following me on Twitter. I, I don't, maybe you do, Brian, you're more popular than I am. I and do. Do you, 61 no, million? <laughs> <laughs> and they think that's a scale of relationships. But people following you on Twitter or likes on your Facebook page or any other fan page, those aren't relationships. Those are, right. you know this, those are indirect kind of things. And so that kind of mass communication is useful in some situations to get a story out, to give news about what's happened, mm -hmm. but that's not relationships. That's Relationships are interactions. And so I don't look for me, Jonathan, trying to scale relationships. I actually look, how do I scale the relationships that is SAP? Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've done a lot and spent a lot of time is, how do I change from the model that has been built up in my industry, mm -hmm. business to business, where we said, we're a singular organization. We're SAP, we're 67,000 strong. We have a unified voice. And here are the five bullet points that we're trying to get out. And we would shout those into the wilderness. And you can shout them by taking an ad out in the newspaper. You can shout them by mm. putting them on Twitter. Or you can, there are lots of ways you can do a TV commercial, right? Mm -hmm. And you communicate to other businesses. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is, A, big glass buildings don't buy software. People do, right? right? And a business isn't a monolithic thing. And the other problem is we SAP aren't a monolithic thing. So I've said, forget that. This is not a B2B or a B2C world. Mm -hmm. This is a person to person world. I couldn't agree more. And so the way I'm scaling, the way I'm in relationship is helping all 67,000 employees of SAP to tell their own story, to become more social, to actually engage with the seven plus million, billion, sorry, people that we have on the planet as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not about scaling Jonathan and trying to have more flights, I fly enough as it is, all that, but it's actually how do we get people to authentically talk about what they do mm -hmm. and how does that amplify the story? So would you consider that marketing or PR? Does it matter? No, but for the sake of the question, would you? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, so I think future marketing, mm. not marketing in the past, and future PR are two sides of the same coin. Mm. Slightly different audiences. And I, so I'm gonna get, I'm going to take a long time to answer this question, but I think the short version of the question is it's probably more marketing than it is PR, and I'll explain why. Okay. I think one of the beauties of being social, and here we took us five minutes, we got to the social conversation here right. pretty quickly, yeah. is it forces us as companies, as big companies, and we're a big one, to ignore or at least try to break down our internal barriers. I'll give you a really simple example. Imagine it's your job to monitor our, I'll just pick Twitter as one example, and we're, you're at SAP, right? Now, if, if you think of this as a shouting platform, then all you have to really do is log on to your favorite Twitter tool and every day or every couple of hours schedule a few tweets and you're done. But that's of course not what it is. It's an interaction environment, right? If it's an interaction environment, imagine somebody comes in and they, they tweet and they ask a question that requires a support person to answer that, something about one of our products or services. Well, you're not gonna be able to know that answer, so you have to figure out how to write that. Right. And then imagine 10 minutes later, somebody else asks a question about how can they get hired? Well, then you've got to figure out what country they're in and et cetera, and you've got to route that. And then somebody else comes in and asks a question that might require legal or finance to get involved. And somebody else comes in and asks a question that looks like they may want to buy a product. You're one person, if you think about it that way, if you're just monitoring, with many, many different. Now, the person on the outside, 
doesn't care whether it's the HR department or the PR department or the marketing department or the finance department or the legal department or the support department or the sales department. They don't care about it. They just want to interact with the brand mm -hmm. and ask a question. Right. Now, if you're a small company, one human being can probably get away with doing this. Mm -hmm. But imagine now we operate in, I think it's 140 different countries. We're 67,000 employees, 250 some thousand plus customers, et cetera. So you're small. We're, we're small. Yeah. yeah. You can't do this on scale. We've had to stop saying this is a marketing or PR or support or sales thing and stop, and that's inside out, and start flipping it around and mm -hmm. say, what is it that consumers want and how do, and how do we design processes to get what they want mm -hmm. rather than when you think about it? And so the lines between marketing and PR and support start blurring. Mm -hmm. And the old adage is we put the customer or the prospect at the center and say, what are their interactions? So did you just describe social business? You know, it's funny. I did just describe social okay. business. And, and I was actually half expecting you to ask me about social media. Yeah. And had you asked about social media, I would have gone on a rant. It's, it wouldn't have been pretty. I probably would have ripped up some paper and yelled at <laughs> you and stuff like that. Because I think one of the things I worry about is when people say social media, they focus on the word media. Right. And media immediately to them, right? And maybe this is because I come with a marketing angle is, they go, oh, great, this is an augment to my TV commercial. This is an augment to my billboards. This is an augment to the newspaper ads. It becomes an outbound kind of thing as well. Mm -hmm. And to me, social business means it's about the business, silly. It's not about social. Mm -hmm. And it's how do you look at your objectives and amplify them using social technology more than anything else. What is the one thing that keeps you up at night being CMO? Wow, the one thing that keeps me up at night? Well, so, I mean, I guess there's two ways to answer that. Mm -hmm. There's the politically correct way to answer that, and there's mm -hmm. the less, so let's do both. Well, we'll edit out the politically correct. No, I'm kidding. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were gonna edit out the politically incorrect. I think in the end, I worry that people think of social as something segregated. So we're on the social topic. This, and that is, to me, I don't have a social strategy. Now, when people say that, how can you not have a social strategy? Didn't you start this by saying some people call you social? Because I have a strategy for the business. Mm -hmm. What is it? We have a product that we need to figure out how to sell more, or we're pretending, we're pretending, we're thinking about building a product mm -hmm. and we need to mass source information about what should be in there, or I gotta do brand protection. We have business objectives mm -hmm. and how to social amplify that. And I think, unfortunately, most people still don't get social, even inside my own organization. Okay. And they think about it as a really big um, megaphone that they can yell into. Right. And when you do that, I'm worried about losing people's trust. Sure. I'm worried about them going, oh, it's time to ignore those guys, right. et cetera. So that, that keeps me up. The other side of the house is one of the things we've changed is marketing is a business in itself. We treat it as p and I mean, I, told, I said earlier, I'm not really a classic marketing guy. I'm a business guy. Mm -hmm. I've been a three-time CEO before I became. And so I think in terms of investments yeah. and returns on investments. I think about expenses and returns. And we treat marketing the same way. Mm -hmm. And because of that, an awful lot of us are actually comped based on the company's revenue. Mm -hmm. So I'm not as quarterly focused as a salesperson would be because that's what sales guys do. Mm -hmm. We're more annually or even two year kind of focused to look at the growth measures. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's I think why some marketing people are changing their titles from chief marketing officer to chief growth officer. Right, chief listening and officer, chief, listen chief, chief this, chief that. Yeah, we can be chief communications if you want <laughs> more than anything else. I, I don't need to change the title. I don't think that's the point. But yeah. focused on medium and long-term growth is the thing that I worry about. And because of that, that means I think the heart of what we have to do is less about product. It's less about sales. There are other people that do that. And it's more about the market. And so what keeps me at is what are the disruptive things that I don't know about yet? What are the trends that are going to impact SAP's businesses next year, two right. years, three years from now? How do I set the company up for things that we don't know? And so I'm, I worry about building a more elastic organization. So who do you empower to do this? Who do you partner with in your organization? What chiefs do you partner with to make this happen? <laughs> Somehow this is going to turn into a chief's <laughs> joke and I shouldn't do that as well. So, you know, marketing is becoming a bit of a glue when it comes to a business, right? And most marketing departments, including mine, sit between the people that develop the product or services that you have. In the software business, they're called engineers, but in any other business, they can be anything else, and those that try to deliver them. And then some business that can be salespeople, that can be services people, et cetera, and we're in there. And the goal, what we try to do is to connect them better to each other mm. and to the people that actually consume their goods and services. So let me give you a simple example. Um, one of the, if you're a product marketing or even a product manager, it's a job I've had earlier in my career, one of the things that you really obsess about a lot is, am I building stuff just for the sake of building things? 
or am I building stuff that anybody cares about? So let me, can we take a small sort of... Let's do it. So long before I became a marketing person or a business person, I was an engineer. I actually developed code. I wrote really obscure code like compilers and software programs and stuff like that. And I remember being... What is your programming language of choice? Today? If you had to be a programmer today. We'll get uh, that answer. Probably C++ is the one I remember the best. Okay. Maybe Java, but C++ is what I programmed the most on when I was a programmer. Okay. So now I've dated myself more than anything else. So actually, I was a C++ programmer. I was working for a relatively small startup. I've been here in Silicon Valley for almost 20 years. I've done a number of startups. And I remember there were a bunch of us sitting in a room, all of us engineers, trying to design the next generation of the product. And I'm 25, 26-year-old who thinks he knows everything and realizes later in life he knows nothing at all. <laughs> and I, I'm listening to this debate of all, of all the engineers of what we should do. And finally, the senior engineer, he's probably 40-something. At the time, I thought he was old. Now I realize he's not old at all. He pulls off his shoe, and in a Khrushchev-style motion, he starts pounding on the table. Imagine one of these big, and everyone turns and looks at him. He goes, we're going to build this. And he describes what the product is going to look like in about a minute, because that's what customer wants. And everybody immediately does what you just did. They all nod, oh, of course. You Why wouldn't we? Got to build what the customer wants. Mm -hmm. And I had one of those flashes that you have a few times in your career. You're smarter than me. Maybe you have them more often where I go, wait a minute. How do we know what the customer wants? And I looked around at all these people. We were all jeans and T-shirts and flip-flops and you know, Silicon Valley gear. And I go, none of us have ever met a customer. We have no idea mm -hmm. what. Could. So I was like, this, is that right? So I immediately walked out of the, the room and I went to the other half of the building. Now, by the way, the engineering half of the building was, you know, donuts and coffee and cola and stuff. I went to the nice half of the building, which is where all the sales and marketing people lived. And they were all wearing suits and, you know, and I walked into a random sales guy's office and I said, I have a question. And I started to describe what we were about to build. Is that what the customer wants? And the sales guy said, I have no idea. Let's go ask. I was like, what? So he put me in his car. It was a nice 7 Series BMW. <laughs> yeah, was not my little cheap car. And we drove to a customer. We walked right in to somebody that was a potential customer, and he said, explain it to him. So I sat down, and in a three-minute conversation, much like I'd felt like in high school, mm. right, back to that personalized interaction, mm -hmm. and he said, I would never buy that. And even if you gave it to me, I'd never use it. And in 20-ish minutes, I basically figured out what the product should be, not because I was smarter, just because, and I thought, interesting. Mm -hmm. How do I do that? So how do I do that on scale? That's the right. thing that yeah. we try to do. And one of the ways we've done this is by trying to have those kind of conversations in a digital world. Mm -hmm. Now, what do I mean by that? We've all probably participated in one of those double-blind stories where you sit behind the smoke glass window and you ask people to, you can't. The, thank you. Thank I, you? I, I agree with you. Am I one of the guys that gave you $20 to go react no, to a product? But, I had some nice food and some m ms exactly. but I appreciate that. Those are interesting, <laughs> but they're not very scalable. Yeah. The digital world allows us to do those every single day in scale, in every culture, in every language as well. So one of the things we did as marketing to help our development colleagues is we built something called Idea Place. And Idea Place lets users, potential users, partners, anybody they want, you can check the SAP Idea Place, just go online, you can find it out, to suggest products and features that should be in our products, or even to suggest new products. And you can actually then ask questions, you can vote on other people's suggestions, you can prove it's a community mm. dedicated to product improvement. And we have one product called Business One, which is small businesses, mm -hmm. where more than half of the features come solely source source from the crowd, not from engineers dreaming it up, but from them being able to do what I did as a 25-year-old, as a mm -hmm. which is go out ask, saying, we're thinking about doing this. What do you think? And people razz them. People mm -hmm. say, no, that's a dumb idea. I'd never pay. Or here's a better idea. And product development now gets crowdsourced mm -hmm. from engineers. As a person who admires a well-thought leader like yourself, what is that one thing that you wake up in the morning, you say, this is what I'm gonna do today. This is what I'm gonna be. This is what the company's gonna be. So the fun thing is, is that one thing is different almost every day. Oh. The, I think if you're a really great marketer, and I don't know that I am, I'd, I aspire to be a really great marketer, then your goal is always to be one step ahead of where the business is now. Your, your superpower, if you allow me to use that phrase, is to try to help the company peer around corners. That means you've gotta be willing to be wrong. It means because nobody predicts the future perfectly. It's just impossible to do. And so what I do a lot is, what happens if the following unexpected things happen? What would we do? Think through that and then, and then say, oh, here's a danger. Here's something, here's a blind spot we have because we don't know that the world might zag. What would we do if it does? And think that way. Mm -hmm. If I can help the company be prepared for a future that we'd have no idea what it is, 
that's the thing that I wake up every morning trying to figure out. Well, that's an exciting place to be. It's fun. It's, I, you know, I like to say I think I have the best job on the planet. Yeah, it sounds like it. And uh, I could sit here and talk to you all day, but unfortunately we're out of time. And no problem. I, I, I appreciate sitting here and talking to you, and thank you, and hopefully we'll get to do this again soon. I'd love to do it. Thanks. I really appreciate spending the time with you. Thanks a lot. Right. See you soon. Cheers.